In the good old days, those before January 2020, there was some semblance of people debating pertinent issues. Among them was climate change and human causation and global temperature increases. Until 2005, most people understood climate change to mean global warming. In order to help us and popular culture embrace the idea that humans are also responsible for even protracted cold spells, Hollywood and a cute kid from Scandinavia demanded we change the label global warming to a more ubiquitous tag, climate change. Now I want you to know that I've been studying, teaching, and writing about aspects of climate change for more than 30 years. I've written two books that examine the facts and science behind the forces that shape weather and climate. But I've been criticized for questioning the extent to which people have created climate change on a global scale. But there is irrefutable proof that major cities register higher temperatures than rural hinterlands that surround them. That's because of a host of factors like black asphalt, dark buildings, and the burning of fuels. You might be saying, Van, you're delusional. We're witnessing rising sea levels and reductions in the quantity of ice in the Arctic. We have to change our way of life. You know, we must reduce our carbon footprint. Well now, that might be true, but the devil's in the details. What are we willing to actually give up to reduce our carbon footprint, especially when no one knows how much an impact on global temperatures those reductions would produce? But as some people point out, any reduction in carbon dioxide is a good reduction. For a host of reasons though, I'm optimistic that people will switch to more efficient and affordable means of transportation and energy without the coercive effects of government. Consider that 15 years ago, most people on the street thought that battery powered cars were a pipe dream. Nowadays, manufacturers are moving at breakneck speed to offer efficient, attractive, and even fast forms of alternate transportation. Not only are cars rolling off the assembly lines, but trucks, bikes, and motorcycles are also gaining a foothold in the marketplace. While I have some questions about the extent to which we humans impact global temperatures, I think that most people, including many po political pundits and news media personnel especially, really don't know the mechanics and history of natural climate change well enough to make declarative statements that push policy toward regulating our behavior. Public officials, including former vice presidents, just don't know the science behind the patterns in, uh, that well of weather, that is. Their solutions could be worse than that which we are currently experiencing. Today on The Vantage Point, I want to dig a bit deeper into the science of natural weather and climate change by visiting 1816, the year without a summer. I hope you'll join me. For more than a century, a period of time that overlaps the age of the National Weather Service, which was established in 1870 under the Grant Administration, Americans have been studying and keeping records on weather patterns. Atmospheric scientists have also studied volcanic activity. We are now nearly convinced that volcanic eruptions that occur in the lower latitudes, that's between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, play a role in atmospheric cooling first and then warming. The reason is because that belt of latitudes is where most of the Earth's energy is absorbed by land, seas, and sky. Indeed, there is an energy surplus in those latitudes. It's through air and ocean currents that surplus energy in the tropics is redistributed or distributed into zones of energy deficit that stretch towards the poles. Particulate matter belched out during eruptions can block out enough sunlight to reduce the amount of energy the ocean currents transport into the middle and upper latitudes. A gigantic eruption on the East Indian island of Krakatoa in 1883 spewed particulate matter like ash into the atmosphere from May 20th until August. Sunlight striking airborne matter from Krakatoa was reflected back into space and as a result global temperatures were markedly lower throughout the next year. Its effects on weather were strong in the northern hemisphere. Bostonians were able to throw snowballs in June. Nevertheless, and once particulate matter settled out of the atmosphere, greenhouse gases that were also belched out during the eruption led to a phase of warming 
that reached its maximum effect during the late 1930s. You might recall that overgrazing and deep plow cultivation in the western Great Plains contributed to the Dust Bowl. Global temperatures dropped to a near record low in the wake of the eruption of Bally's Mount Angung in 1963. Almost 30 years later, on July 16, 1990, the island of Luzon in the Philippines was rocked by an earthquake that registered 7.8 on the Richter scale. The epicenter was 60 miles northeast of Mount Pinatubo. The earthquake was a precursor to a buildup of volcanic gases that caused a violent eruption on Pinatubo on June 15th. The gaseous explosion expelled one cubic mile of sunlight deflecting material into the atmosphere. Throughout the remainder of 1991 and on through 1993, global temperatures dropped by a half degree Celsius or about a degree Fahrenheit. Consider what happened to mid-latitude weather conditions when Tambora, a volcano in Indonesia, erupted in 1815. It caused sufficient quantities of particulate matter to enter the atmosphere, where energy was either absorbed or reflected back into space. The result was a significant drop in mid-latitude temperatures over the next year, which historians and geographers call the year without a summer. During that year, there were periods of warmth, but they didn't last that long, and invariably they were followed by cold spells in each of the summer months. Snow accumulated in parts of Massachusetts in June, and in Cabot, Vermont on June 8th, snow reportedly reached a depth of 18 inches. Southern states were not spared from the abnormal weather. Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to Albert Gallatin from his home in Monticello, that's in Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley, in which he described local drought conditions as well as summer weather patterns that seemed more like a mild winter than a typical Virginia summer. Particulate matter, primary, primarily ash and sulfur aerosols that spewed from Tambora, did not act alone in causing the year without a summer, however. The year 1816 was in the midst of the Dalton Minimum, one of the sun's extended periods of low activity. It lasted from 19, or 1795 to 1820s. It's also thought that the earth may have wobbled a bit off of its 23.5 degree tilt. The drought conditions of Virginia, especially combined with cooler or colder air temperatures, suggest that moisture from the Gulf was not abundant, which is symptomatic of a lack of heat-generated evaporation that produced low-pressure centers, including hurricanes and tropical storms in the Gulf of Mexico. Indeed, Andreas Poe, the author of a generally accepted uh, source for North Atlantic hurricanes between 1493 and 1855, he identified six hurricanes in 1815, which one was observed as far north as 40 degrees. Poi claims that only one hurricane made landfall in the Southern Caribbean on the island of Martinique in 1816. However, Michael Chenoweth conducted a thorough re-examination of Poi's conclusions and decided to reject one of the 1816 hurricanes and two of the 1815 hurricanes. Nevertheless, no hurricanes made landfall in North America in 1816. There's no way of knowing about the frequency of lesser, eh, intense, low-pressure centers that formed in the Gulf. However, given the dry conditions that Jefferson wrote about, one could assume that humidity fed into Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana by low-pressure centers over the Gulf of Mexico was greatly reduced in 1816. Had there been normal amounts of humidity drawn into the westerly winds that typically cross the Mississippi, Tennessee, and Shenandoah Valleys, coupled with the colder temperatures that made Virginia seem as though it was in the midst of a mild winter, condensation would have accelerated and consequently there would have been more storms and thus powerful frontal precipitation which lasts for days, farmers love those, over Monticello. These weather phenomena certainly would have caught the eye of the former president. On the contrary, it was their absence that he wrote about to Gallatin. Hurricanes and warm ocean currents that fuel them serve a valuable purpose in dispersing moisture and heat poleward. They actually help make living in the northern latitudes a bit easier by contributing heat into the areas of energy deficit, which includes more than half of North America and Eurasia. Keep in mind that the Southern Hemisphere is known as the Water Hemisphere for a good reason. There just isn't much land in the Southern Hemisphere below 30 degrees south.
Knowing about weather and climate, I believe, is as important as knowing about history and what makes us tick. That knowledge, though, should start with a solid understanding of Earth-Sun relationships. There are major periods of time in which the Sun is more active, and conversely, there are large spans of time, like the Dalton Minimum, in which the Sun is less active. There are other natural processes that also influence weather and climate. Volcanic eruptions are just one of the many ways in which nature influences weather and short-term climatic patterns. 1816, the year without a summer, is just one example of how two forces of nature, the Dalton Minimum and the volcanic eruption of Tambora, combine to make life move at a different pace. Well, I hope you enjoyed our topic today and got something out of it. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, please take care of you and yours. I'll see you on the vantage point. Bye-bye.